open your Bibles with me to the Gospel record of Luke in chapter 9, commencing in verse number 28 through verse 36. The Gospel of Luke in chapter number 9. And I want to commence reading in verse number 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease or his exodus, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk a moment to us in this worship about missing the significance of transfiguration. Missing the significance of transfiguration. I mentioned to the people who were here in our early service that there are some scenes in the Bible, and I'm sure you've had this experience perhaps, but there are some passages of scripture, some scenes in the Bible that are so uplifting and exciting that I just wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been there when God opened the Red Sea and the people walked over on dry ground because of God's providential care of them. He loved them so much he wouldn't even let them get their feet muddy. I wish I could have been on, that, on, on the shores of the Red Sea when Pharaoh's army washed up on the seashore and Moses' sister Miriam grabbed a tambourine and started singing a new song. God is a man of war. He's fought many battles and he's never lost one. And Jehovah is his name. I wish I could have tasted that manna that fell in the wilderness. Can you imagine what bread from heaven must taste like? Uh, it was so sweet to their taste that they called it manna, which means, what is this? I wish I was at that wedding in Cana of Galilee when they ran out of wine and Jesus told them to fill water pots with water. And between the dipping and the sipping, it became extraordinary wine. And the governor of the feast said, you've saved the best wine for last. I wish I would have shown up when all the Randalls and HEBs were closed. And there was nowhere to buy any bread. And there was a little boy with two fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus said, bring it to me. 
And they gave it to Jesus and he lifted it up to his father. And when he brought it down in his hands, he started adding by subtracting and multiplying by dividing. And when he got through sending it out, there were 12 baskets left over. I wish I could have been there at that picnic when Jesus fed the 5,000. I wish I would have walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus when those two men were leaving Jerusalem and Jesus came up behind them and they didn't even know it was Jesus. And he said, why are you so sad? And they said, don't you know what just happened here? And Jesus started preaching to them about himself. I wish I could have heard Jesus' commentary on Jesus. But I wish really I could have been brothers and sisters on Mount Hermon when Jesus was transfigured before their very eyes. In the transfiguration scene, Jesus' glory is proleptically unveiled. That word proleptic or prolepsis is the representation or the assumption of a future act or development as if presently existing or already accomplished. In verse 29, if your Bible is still open, in verse 29, the scripture says, And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. The word for altered, his face was altered, is the Greek word heteros, which stands in sharp contrast to the Greek word alos. Alos meaning another of the same kind, Whereas heteros means another of a different kind. This effulgent, effervescent glory was a revelation of the glory that Jesus had worn like a robe of light when he was in eternity past with God the Father. This light, this glory was the glory that he set aside to come to earth to die in our place. It's a blazing brightness that was a revelation of the splendor of his sinless humanity. And it only happened, the scripture says, when he prayed. I wish I had somebody to help me preach it. Uh, brothers and sisters, I sincerely believe that tr prayer transfigures us. Communion with God changes us. Somebody ought to help me preach it. It may not change your circumstance, but it'll change how you react in the midst of your circumstance because prayer has a way of transfiguring you to make you realize that God may not get you out of it, but he has a way of getting in it with you. Somebody here who reads the Bible will help me testify that God didn't get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fiery furnace. He just got in there with them. God didn't get Daniel out of the lion's den. He just got in there with him. And God, you don't have to move the mountain. Just give me the strength to climb. If I can't climb it, let me go around it. If I can't go around it, let me go through it. But whatever you're going through, if you pray and commune with God, God will transfigure you in the midst of your prayer. Uh, suddenly. The Bible says, suddenly, two men appeared from the past. Suddenly. Uh, this, is, this is a liberating hermeneutic. Uh, suddenly. These two men appear from the past. Whenever God is getting ready to do something earth-shattering, two men show up. Uh, at the resurrection, uh, two men were in the tomb when the women got there, uh, one at the head and the other at the foot, and they said, why seek ye the living among the dead? I wish I had a Bible reader. He's not here. He's risen just as he said. When Jesus got on the cloud and got ready to go back to heaven, two men 
stood by them in white raiment and said to them, why stand ye idly gazing? The same Jesus that you see going up is coming back again. And here on Mount Hermon at the Mount of Transfiguration, two men from the past show up to talk to Jesus. The first man was Moses. Moses, up from an unmarked grave. A grave dug for him by angels. Uh, angels, seraphim were his pallbearers. He's buried on Nebo's lonely mountain and Jude says he's kept out of Satan's hands by the archangel Michael. Is that Moses, uh, the son of Yoshebed and Amram, who, who was adopted son of Pharaoh's uh, daughter, who is now here up from the grave talking to Jesus. God didn't let him go in the promised land, but God raised him up long enough to talk to Jesus on Mount Hermon. Whereas Moses came up from the grave, Elijah came down from glory. The glory that he ascended to on a chariot of fire. One, Moses, represents all those who have died in Christ and will be raised when Christ comes again. And the other representative, Elijah, stands for all those who will be raptured or still alive at the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, hear me. The association with Jesus and Moses and Elijah is in itself an auspicious portrait of the continuation and the consummation of God's ancient eschatological purpose in our lives. Hear me, beloved. Moses and Elijah are the ratification of Jesus' identity and the voice of God from the cloud is the confirmation of Jesus' destiny. Uh, because you have to tie the transfiguration into what just took place some verses before it. You, 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 you cannot pull the transfiguration out of context because you will miss what happened before it that occasioned the transfiguration. They were on the shores of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And some of the disciples said, you're Moses or you're Elijah or one of the prophets. And Jesus got more pointed with them and said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now Moses and Elijah show up in the flesh to demonstrate that what Peter just said is true. He's not a new Moses. He's not an old Elijah. He's the son of God without sin and the son of man with power. He is not Moses. He's not on the level with Moses because if Jesus was another Moses, we would still be lost. Somebody ought to help me preach it. He's not another Elijah because although Elijah never tasted death, Elijah never died for my sin. Jesus and Moses and Elijah are up on this mountain and and the law of Moses and the spirit of Elijah were both being rendered obsolete by the determination of Jesus to follow the way of the cross. And brothers and sisters, the lesson here for us is that to be transfigured, one must be willing to be disfigured. Let me run that by you one more time. To be transfigured, one must be willing to be disfigured. 
Because not only must you reckon with what Jesus says before the transfiguration, you've got to reckon with what he talks about after transfiguration. And what he talks about in the next verses is going to the cross to die. If suffering is involved in Messiahship, then suffering is no less involved in discipleship. Because Jesus said, if you would be my disciple, you got to deny yourself, take up a cross, and follow me. But, but I want you to get this. If you don't get anything else I've said this morning, get this. In all of this glory, in all of this brilliance, in all of this effulgent, effervescent brightness, Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah come from the dead to talk to Jesus and the disciples are sleeping. Kind of like some of y'all doing while I'm preaching right now. Moses and Elijah has come to talk to Jesus and the church is sleeping. That, that, that's not W.E.B. Du Bois talking to Martin Luther King and, and Nelson Mandela because that would keep me up for about six weeks at a time. This is Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. They have come from the dead to talk to Jesus and the disciples are sleeping. They are about to miss the significance of transfiguration. Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. I, I wouldn't ask, so I'm going to have to imagine what they said. Uh, you wouldn't ask, so you don't know what they said either, so you got to say amen because what you think is just about what I think. They were talking to Jesus, and I'm certain Moses said the law is finished. Prophecy has ceased. We've done everything we could, and they still lost. The law couldn't save them. They would not believe prophecy. Jesus, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. It's all up to you now. Because law and prophecy fall exhausted at the feet of Jesus. Because brothers and sisters, Jesus does not come to destroy the law. He comes to fulfill it. Jesus is not the end of prophecy, Jesus is who they've been prophesying about. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Let, let, let me see if I can make this make sense. Uh, Moses was on a mountain, and when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was shining. But the shining from Moses' face was a reflected glory. But Jesus' face was shining from a perfected glory. Because what was on the inside of Jesus came on the outside of Jesus. And they saw what he looked like before he painted flesh on himself. Somebody missed that. He, he, he was in his full glory and they saw him, but his was not like Moses' glory. Moses' glory was re reflected because he saw somebody. Jesus' glory is perfected because he is the somebody Moses saw. When Moses saw Jesus, his face was shining extrinsically. But Jesus' face was shining intrinsically because Jesus is the God that Moses saw on the mountain. And the church is sleeping. They have missed the significance of transfiguration. And brothers and sisters, as I hurry, it's easy for you to come to 40 days of purpose and miss it. 
It's easy for you to come to class. And I see many of you running the red light and passing up stop signs and getting off from work early to get here to 40 days of purpose. You want to get to your class. You want to facilitate. You want to be there to contribute to the conversation. And that's wonderful. That's what you ought to do. But if it doesn't turn into 40 years of purpose... You've missed the entire reason for coming in the first place. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. God says in the book of Amos, I won't attend your solemn assemblies. Uh, he says in the book of Micah, I don't care anything about your rivers of oil. He's shown you, O oh man, what is good. That you do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Coming to church every Sunday is wonderful, but you can miss it looking at the wrong thing. Let me see if I can get this over to us, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave you alone. They missed it. Peter missed it. The, the, the disciples missed it because they tied theology to a tent. All this heavenly stuff going on, and Peter says the stupidest thing he's ever said. He said, Lord, it's good to be here. That sounds so spiritual. That sounds so churchy. That sounds so godly. Lord, it's good to be here. Let's build some churches. Let's build some tabernacles. Let's build some tents. Let's get a piano and an organ. Let's get a deacon family ministry number seven. Let's elect the president of the mission. Let's make sure that we have a nice tent to put you and Moses and Elijah in. He missed it because Jesus can never be put on the same level with Moses and Elijah. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's build three tents. Let's, let's tether, let's tie our theology to a building. And brothers and sisters, you miss it if you left God here last Sunday. And so that's why you got to sit in your seat because that's where God was last Sunday. Uh, that, that's why you got to be where you need to be because you left God in that place last Sunday. You haven't talked to him since last Sunday. You haven't communed with him since last Sunday. You haven't read his word since Tuesday night. You haven't developed a relationship with him that transcends the tabernacle. Because if God is just in this place, you miss it. No, 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 no. God is in the line with you at the supermarket. God is with you driving on 45 and 59. God is with you when you sit down at Luby's and Papado's. God is with you when you go to visit people in the hospital. God is with you on your job, in your home. Take the name of Jesus with you everywhere you go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Not just in this church, not just in this neighborhood, but everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men. That they may see your good works and not give you any glory but glorify the Father who is in heaven. They tried to tie theology to a tent. And then secondly, they tried to hide holiness on a hill. They're up on this mountain, this, this high elevation, 9,000 feet over the city of Caesarea Philippi, overlooking everything. And Peter said, Lord, let's stay here. And I know worship is so good sometimes and, 
and the choir is so wonderful and the preaching is so good and the fellowship is so nice that you are tempted to just want to be in that rare air all the week long. But as soon as you get out of here, you run into the devil. Somebody scratch your car. In the church parking lot. You just shouted. You just gave God praise. You all sweated from raising your hand. And they done ding your car and didn't even leave a note. All that Holy Spirit you just had. And you get to your car and say, God, who scratched my car? It's gone. You get home, the food ain't ready. Talk back to me if you can. You get to Luba's, they give you the wrong stuff. You didn't even order that. You're trying to get your clothes together because you hate getting to work in the morning. All that spirit you had on Sunday is gone and you just want to stay here. But the reason you can't stay here is because something is going on in the valley. I'm not talking about nobody ding in your car. I'm not talking about the food not ready. I'm not talking about they mess up your order at the restaurant. I mean there's a boy in there who's demon possessed. And his father brought him to church and the church couldn't heal him. And when you stay up on the mountain, you miss the opportunity to heal those who are in the valley. Somebody's child needs to hear that there's a bomb in Gilead. Somebody's son needs to know that there's a way that seems right. But the end thereof are ways of death. There's some young girl walking on the wrong road. And they need some church woman. To tell her that if you don't turn around. Bad things are in your future. Have I got a witness here? And brothers and sisters. If you miss what Jesus is trying to get over to you. Here's what will happen to you finally. They missed it. Because they were looking for transfiguration when salvation is about transformation. And you are nowhere near ready to be transfigured till you've been transformed. Mm. Brothers, I beseech you by the mercies of God I need two or three Bible readers here. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service. Be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Somebody ought to help me close here. And brothers and sisters, to make sure they got it, I want you to see this and I'm going to be through. Uh, the cloud came down. Somebody got to hold me because I've been to shout here. The Shekinah cloud came down Moses must have started shouting because Moses remembered that cloud it's the same cloud that covered him on Mount Sinai and Elijah must have broke out in the holy dance because that's the same cloud that he got on as transportation to go to heaven without dying. Y'all gonna help me close this, won't you? But there's something else going on in the cloud. The cloud surrounds them. And Peter, James, and John are invited in the cloud. 
But something happens that's worth shouting about. A dove comes in the cloud. I've been wondering where that dove has been. Because the last time we saw him, he was at Noah's Ark. And he's been flying around looking for the one. Uh, he he, he might have got on Moses' shoulder, but he had to fly off. He might have got on David, but he had to fly off. He might have got on Solomon, but he had to fly off. He got on Zerubbabel and had to fly off. Samson and had to fly off. He finally found who he was looking for. He found Jesus at the baptism and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But his work wasn't over. Because on the mountain of transfiguration, he came to Jesus again, but this time, he's not talking to Jesus. He's talking to the disciples. Because Jesus already knows who he is. And when you know who you are, you don't need anybody to confirm you. When you know who you are, you don't need anybody to validate you. When you know who you are, you don't need nobody patting you on the back and, and, and trying to flatter you and make you feel good. When you know who you are, when you're comfortable in your own skin, you can walk to your own music. Somebody in here this morning who know who you are. You ain't got to be sitting in no certain section. Nobody got to speak to you. Nobody got to kiss you and welcome you and, and, and all of that. Listen to me, beloved. Uh, you can't grow in no churches where they got to high five three people. No, it, it ain't no spiritual growth in that. When, when, when I come to church, I ain't got time to be hitting you and, and high five. I, I need you to leave me alone because I need to preach it or open the word of God so that I can look at my face like in a mirror and see where I'm messing up because I need God to work on me. I know how wicked my heart is. I know that my mind is prone to wonder so I don't need to have five nobody. I need to hear, is there any word from the Lord? I'm through. I'm through. But when the cloud lifted, here's a good time to shout. When the cloud lifted, Moses and Elijah was gone. And the last man standing was Jesus. And this morning, the last man standing is still Jesus. There's nobody like him. He's in a class all by himself. The more I call him, the sweeter it sounds. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noonday. Jesus late in the evening. Jesus in the midnight hour. I feel like calling that name a minute. Because there's power in that name. Thank you, Moses. But you ain't Jesus. Thank you, Elijah. But you're not Jesus. Thank you, David. But you're not Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 
Y'all gonna help me close this, won't you? Read in Nazareth. Baptized in the Jordan. Performed miracles in a desert place. Wept over Jerusalem. Prayed in Gethsemane. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He made the lame to walk. There's nobody like him. He's God's only son. He's Mary's baby boy. He's James and Jude's older brother. He's Matthew's king. He's Mark's suffering servant. He's Luke's great physician. He's John's word made flesh. He's Acts coming of the Holy Ghost. He's the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. I don't want to miss it, brothers and sisters. That's why I come to church on Sunday. Because I don't want to miss what God is doing in my life. That's why I get on my knees every day. Because I don't want to miss what God is doing in my life. He brought me from a mighty long way. Is there anybody here? No God has brought you. Is there anybody here? No, you didn't make it by yourself. All the stuff you've been through, the Lord had to protect you. All the doors God has opened for you. All the ways God has made for you. You don't need no preacher to tell you to give God some praise. You don't need a choir director to tell you to open your mouth and, and clap your hands. When you think about all the tears he's dried, all the prayers he's answered, how he protected you when you didn't even, even know his name, you ought to give God your best hallelujah. If the Lord opened doors for you, help me praise his name. If the Lord saved you from a burning hell, help me give his name glory. If the Lord wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life, now would be a good time to tell him thank you. If the Lord made your enemy your footstool, tell God thank you. If God helped you raise your children by yourself, Tell God thank you. If God paid your rent for you, tell God thank you. If God kept you on your job when they were trying to get you fired, tell God thank you. If God raised you up when they thought they were pushing you down, tell God thank you. If he's been a mother for you, if he's been a father for you, if he's been a husband for you, if he's been company for you, tell God thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I can't help myself right now. I was sick and looked like I wouldn't get well. But the Lord put his hands on me. And here I am this morning saying, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. If the Lord's been good to you, why don't you witness to somebody? Why don't you hug somebody? Why don't you tell somebody? I'm not trying to bother you now. I'm not trying to get on your nerves. I just got to tell somebody. I just got to let somebody know I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, I was seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry from the water, from the water, he lifted me. Now safe, safe am I. Love, love, love lifting me, 
we nothing else could help Lord lifting me have he been good to you I said has he been good to you come on give him praise come on tell him thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you I know he's alright Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know he's all right. He forgave me. He brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's been a doctor for me. He's been a father for me. He's been a savior for me. He died. Didn't he die? The bright early Sunday morning. He got up with all power in his hand if he got up in you I said if he got up in you tell him thank you for the resurrection thank you for my transfiguration thank you for my salvation thank you I know he's all for granted that God just got to bless me I don't want to be that foolish to think that God just needs me no 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 I need him to walk with me I need him because the going is tough and the hills get hard to climb I need him because one day I'm going to come to the end of my journey. One day this lifeless form known as Terry Anderson will be brought to Houston Memorial Gardens and some preacher will stand over my grave and say for as much as it has pleased Almighty God in his wise providence to take out of this world the soul of this our deceased brother. We do hereby commit this clay tabernacle to its kindred elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. And they will throw flowers on my casket and dirt on my grave, but that won't be the end of Terry Anderson. For we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have another building, a house not made with hands but eternal 
in the heavens. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, not meaning I may or may not go, but since I'm going, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also.